There was a small village that sat on the banks of the Zab River. The name of the village was Pelopia. It was a wonderful place in an area we know today as Turkey. And as the Greeks began to conquer and colonize, they gave the village a new name. They named it Thyatira, which means, uh, the, the meaning of the word Thyatira means perfume or odor of labor, of affliction. In, in that village, they had these trade guilds and businesses, and it was a hard-working city. This city will look at this church that's planted there in the city of Pelopia or Thyatira. Today it's known as Akisar. And they still produce some of the same products that they did back then. They, they produce cotton and wool and cloth and fruit and dyes that would color the cloth. You might remember the name of a woman who was in the book of Acts, in the book of Philippians. She was down by a river with some people praying, and God spoke to her heart. She was a seller of purple. Her name was Lydia, and she was from the city of Thyatira. And so the, 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 the city we're looking at, this church that has its issues as well as its good points. There in verse 18, chapter 2, and the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, your patience or perseverance, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. You're, you're growing. You're moving forward. You're continuing to excel. But it's interesting how it starts. It's the Son of God with eyes like fire. Eyes like fire. And feet like burnished bronze or brass. And it's one of the only times in the whole book of Revelation where Jesus reveals himself or calls himself, these are his words, the Son of God. The Son of God. It's, it's, you know, sometimes cults will come and knock on your door and will say, Jesus never called himself the Son of God. Well, yes, he does. Very clearly calls himself the Son of God right here. And he says the Son of God has eyes like fire. Feet like brass. The implication here is that his eyes are penetrating, that they're powerful. It's kind of like x-ray vision, that he can see, he can, he can burn through, he can cut through, he can pierce through, he can, he can you, you know, many times in, in the New Testament, Jesus would be listening and talking and, and he would say things like this, why have you said in your heart? And people would be caught, caught off guard. Well, how, he, he knows what I'm thinking. Yeah. He has those eyes. Like fire. He sees through all our facade, all our excuses, all our disguises, all our compromises, as well as the good things. He sees it all. And he has those bronze feet symbolizing authority, stability, and judgment. They trample out. They walk through. Through injustice. He has authority. See, he has, he has authority as the Son of God to look into my life and to your life and, and, and not only to comfort and, but also to correct, to challenge and to walk among us and speak to us as he's walking among this church and the Thyra Tyra church with all its goodness, but also those, the, the symbolism is, here's someone who sees it all and has authority to speak into it. 
with vision and with power. And he says, as I look, as I walk among you, listen to what he says. He says, I, I, I know your work. I see your love. I, I see the love that you have, and I see your, your faith. I see your service. I see your perseverance or, or patience. And, and I want you to listen. I want you to hear this part. They're all intertwined together, these, these things that Jesus sees. As he looks with those fiery eyes, those resurrected eyes, this is not, you know, meek and mild Jesus coming in on a donkey anymore. This is resurrected Jesus with all power and with all authority to step into the midst of a church for, for he's the creator of the church. He's the one who, who brought the church into existence by his death and resurrection. And so he can step into it and speak into it. You know, I, don't, I remember when our kids were, were, were little and, you know, I'd have to step into, I don't know if you have, I'm sure you've had to do this if you've had kids, you know, you put them down for sleep, but they won't go to sleep and they're making all this noise and you have to step in there with those bronze feet and those eyes like fire. <laughs> I, I, we had a couple of grandkids. We had four granddaughters spend the night recently. There's two younger ones in one room, two younger ones in another room, and the two older ones wanted to go to sleep. The two younger ones, not so much. And they're just making noise. They're, they're laughing. And so uh, Lynn goes back there, and she's going to bring an end to this chaos. And she walks out two minutes later. It's the same scenario. The other ones are whining because they want to go to sleep. These won't let them. And she goes, John, you're going to have to go over there. <laughs> so with eyes of fire, <laughs> I walk in. And, 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 and I, I said this. I said, okay, which one of you want to go home right now? Their, their eyes got like fire, and they, they like, so, so, so I got your suitcase out here. I'm calling one of your dads. One of you's going home. If I hear another word, I'll take you in your car. I'll, I'll call him, and you'll go home. And they just went, oh, my gosh. Never heard another word out of, <laughs> out, out of those. <laughs> you said you're mean. Eyes of fire, feet like brass. <laughs> they don't talk to me anymore, but, you know, they... <laughs> He says, I see your, but he starts off by saying, I see your faith, I see your service, I see your perseverance, I, I see your patience. I, I see your love. This, this is what he says. He begins off like this. I see your heart, basically. I see your love. And it's amazing to me that the Lord sees what our heart is tied to. He sees what our heart desires and what it loves, what it longs for, what it needs, and, and, and what our hearts embrace and, and hold dear. He says, I see your heart, what it loves. And he knows that they love him and they love one another. And, and the heart that, that loves God, it longs for him. Well, it's this, it's this group of words here. He says that it, it always leads, someone who has a heart that loves the Lord, it leads to service, faith, and endurance. And they were people who served and service to him is always connected with people. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you just love yourself. No, he doesn't say that. He says, by this will all men know that you're really my disciples if you love one another. And I see your heart. And a heart always le leads to, to service. And Jesus loved the Father. And he would say over and over again, I came to serve and do the will of the Father. And he says, Jesus, I see your heart. I see your love. I see your service. The, the, the love they had for the Lord led them to serve, serve the Lord in faith. And, and, and they went about preaching the gospel and caring and, and, and forgiving and touching and as a believer, if you love God, you'll find yourself involved in the life of other people, serving. 
God has this plan and this purpose and calling on my life and your life. And, and, and it includes, well, it includes service. It includes faith. It includes perseverance, patience. And this is stuff, listen, this is stuff you can see. And Jesus says, I see it. I see it. You, you, can, you can see people sometimes and, and you think, wow, you know, that person is, you know, I, I came up here yesterday with my wife and we had, uh, were helping get some things ready for the meeting yesterday and I, I walked back in the kitchen and there's all these women in there serving. And it was amazing just to, just to watch it. And we had gone over to a bakery in Pensacola. Lynn and I had bought all these uh, peta, pedophores. I think that's how you say it. You, I, I tried to look up what a pedophore was. I kept getting pedophile. Off. They, well, <laughs> I didn't buy pedophiles. <laughs> pedophores. But what's her name? Couldn't find them. But it's interesting. They're, they're actually spelled petite. Petitophores. Little bitty cakes. I tested a few of them to make sure they were okay for the women. <laughs> if you eat a lot of them, you're not petite. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so trusting the Lord to provide, to lead, to be there. It's faith. It's this is not giving up. You know, that's what he's saying. I see you didn't give up. You, you've, you've got a heart that loves, a heart that serves, a heart that believes I'm going to show up. Not, you're not, you didn't just start well, he says. But you finished well. You're still going. You, in fact, he, he, he says, I, I know your works. It's love, service, faith, patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Wouldn't that be a great way to end up? Man, the last was more than the first. And all that he called me or asked me to do for him. And then with those eyes and those feet of authority, he, he goes on, and he, and he begins to, to deal with some other things. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, verse 20, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. You allow, you tolerate, you put up with. I'm not pleased, he says, with, especially with, the, the, with the, uh, this one Jezebel. And, and he, he begins to talk about causing you to commit acts of immorality and leading you into deception and false worship, idolatry. You, you turned your heart, he said, away from me. And you've compromised your walk with me and your worship to me. Now, worship is a wonderful, interesting thing. We come here to worship. We, we come from a heart that's, you know, it's, you know, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. And so we come with this heart that's been forgiven much and offer ourselves to him in praise and adoration. Uh, we, we give our tithes, our offerings, uh, as acts of worship. To, to, to just love him. To return his love. To thank him. To, to humble ourselves before him. To, to sense his presence. And to hope to get a glimpse together. Of his holiness and his majesty. And his greatness and his glory. Just Lord here we are. With forgiven hearts. With anticipation, expectation. It's something, worship is something the Lord desires. And it's certainly something he deserves. And so that's why we come. So he comes to a church that have allowed and tolerated that which is replaced or opposed to worship with idolatry. He, he points out this person, Jezebel. And, and I'm sure everyone who's reading or hearing this letter knows who the individual is. Influential. Domineering, it seems. 
and leading people into that which God is opposed to or that the Lord sees and, and describes as immoral and idolatrous. Now, that might not be her real name. I don't know. I mean, the Lord would give names to people sometimes that would define who they were, their character. Like the apostle Peter, whose name was Simon. Remember that? He said, he said I, I know you're like shifting sand. You're unstable. But you'll be Petros, a rock. And he gave him a new name. It's amazing how God can look into a person's life and see what others don't see. How he can, can, can see potential in you or I that, that no one else sees. You don't even see yourself. He says, I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have a calling. Your, your name's not going to be shifting sand. You're going to be a rock. But he calls this one Jezebel. Not the most endearing name. You know, I don't think in all the years that I've been here as a pastor that anyone's ever brought up their daughter and, and said, today I'd like you to dedicate little Jezebel for me. <laughs> I've never heard anyone name that before. <laughs> Jezebel defines one of the most malicious persons in the whole Old Testament. Sort of the Carilla Deville of the Old Testament. She's a queen, the wife of King Ahab, king of the northern tribes when they were split apart, and she introduced the worship of one of the most cruel gods, false gods named Baal, and she brought prostitution into the temple as, as part of worship. And she brought the nation into immorality and seduction. And she used her position to manipulate her husband, her influence, her wealth to infect an entire kingdom. So Jesus says, in, in the midst of this church, this is, this is crazy. There's someone like that who's got that kind of influence and that kind of Heart. Now, Jezebel in the Old Testament sponsored 800 false prophets. And her husband, King Ahab, well, he was kind of a wimp. One day he was pouting there in the palace and she comes up to him. Jezebel does, what's wrong? He says, oh, this guy Naboth has this vineyard and all this land and it's beautiful and it stretches out before me and he won't sell it to me. He's dedicated the land, a legacy to his family and to his children. And, and Jezebel listened to the story. And she responded. She said, well, let mommy fix that for you. So Jezebel had Naboth killed, took his land. She manipulated and influenced. When, when the kingdom was finally taken from them, she meets a horrible and cruel death as she opposed the new leadership. I, I don't know if you know the story, and I don't, I don't want to tell the whole thing, but she got pushed out of a window, if you know the story. And then the wild animals <laughs> ate her body. Isn't that a nice story? I mean, it's a, good, it's a great story. That was Jezebel in the Old Testament. And the Lord says, you have someone in the church of Thyatira. It, it's, and it's not about her being a woman. It's not about gender or position. It's what she condones and the gossiping and the dividing. Jesus calls it, he goes so far as to call it false worship, idolatry. He calls the immorality and the walking away from true worship, idolatry. It, it's living a way that rejects. See, here's, here's the thing about idolatry is I've tried to say, what is he saying here? What does he mean? Why is that idolatry? Well, if you disregard God's truth and authority, see, if, if God's word does not create any boundaries for you, well, I'll do whatever I want to. I know God says this. If he has no authority over your lifestyle, no control over what you choose to do. No power over your decisions. Is he really God? Doesn't seem like it. 
See, because God has power. God has authority. God has boundaries. God has truth. God, God's the one who sets things in order. And Jesus here with those eyes and those feet of authority, he walks into the church and he goes, you know what? You, you, my authority means nothing to you. The boundaries I've set about immorality and false worship, and all, you, you're just ignoring. You, you're slowly being drawn into something that's corrupt and wrong for you. So, so, you know, I don't really see how I'm your God. You've replaced me. See, I believe God has placed within you and I a deep desire to worship and to serve. And you will worship and serve him or you'll substitute it for something else. Pleasure, self-gratification, wealth, whatever it might be. It might not be a little chubby Buddha sitting in your house. A pagan image. But to say, God, I, I'm not listening to you or doing what you say is just as offensive as setting up a pagan God. So he comes into Thyatira. He says some great things are going on. But he says, here are some things that I see that I just can't tolerate. And he says in verse 21, and I, and I gave her time to repent of her immorality. And she did not. Indeed, I'll cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, lest they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children. Now, this may not be her, her, her biological children, but I think what's being said here is those who follow and who've gotten behind this. And they'll, they'll know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Wow, Jezebel. Not just her, but those who follow after her, her children. And then he says something. I love this part here, this one verse 21. He says, I gave her time to change. I gave her time to respond. I gave her time to repent. But she doesn't want to. Aren't you grateful that God gives time? He, he, he allows a certain amount of time for us to change, to come to him. I will give you time. I, I spoke to you, he says, and, and I'm giving her time. And, he, and he'll convict us. He'll reveal to us. He may even scare you. God's good at scaring you. To bring you to the truth. To come home. And his whole, his whole issue is that, that he has what's best for us and knows what's bad for us. Sometimes we think we're, we get away with things and God doesn't care. You know, well, I'm doing this and no one knows, but God's still blessing the business. He, he's still good to me. I'm still healthy and, you know. But I always want to remind myself as well as you and I that don't mistake God's grace and love to allow time for you to respond. Don't mistake that for he doesn't care about what you're really doing. Oh, he does. He gives some rope sometimes. But God, listen, this is what I found out in my life. God will not ignore disobedience because he loves you. I mean, if you've ever, you know, raised children, you ignore their disobedience. Lynn and I always had this statement in, in our parenting growing up, pay now or pay later. And the price later is a much bigger price than dealing with kids now and beginning to instruct them in what's right and what's wrong for their good as well as your own sanity. So he's saying, I'm giving her some time. That's his nature. He's gracious. He didn't come just to fix you and I. He came to make us brand new. That if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Not I go to church and I'm still the same old person. No. God says, I will give you time. Jesus had very little good to say about those 
who were phonies in the New Testament. Who thought, well, I don't need any help. Who pretended to be righteous and holy. He called them snakes and vipers. I'd like to be called a snake or a viper by Jesus. He, 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 he basically said they slither around. They're, they're, they're full of hypocrisy. And God, God, you know, deals with it over and over again in Scripture. And perhaps you remember in the very beginning of the church, there was some hypocrisy that was dealt with. And the, the persons of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that story? That's an amazing story. I want you to just listen to, to the Lord dealing with some hypocrisy in the book of Acts. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart. The church has just been birthed on the day of Pentecost. And the multitude of those who believed, and it was 3,000, were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold things and brought the proceeds, and they were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. They distributed them as each one needed. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, was given this name, Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So 3,000 get saved. Now listen, they're from all kind of different regions and areas all over Israel and beyond. The church has just been birthed. It's not possible for them to go back to their hometown and plug into a fellowship and be discipled and trained and, and learn about Jesus. Because there are no churches at this time. There are no fellowships. It just happened in Jerusalem. And, and most of the believers are centered there. So what do you do with 3,000 new baby Christians and no churches to go back to? You send them home? No. This is a period of time. In the early church where they began to sell possessions, bind together, take care of one another's need so they could be instructed and discipled till they grew up enough to go back and plant churches in the regions that they were from. That's what's going on. It wasn't meant to last forever. But at that time, it was very necessary. And then it goes on, but a certain man named Ananias... With Sapphira, his wife, they sold a possession, and they kept pack, back part of it, his wife being aware of it as well, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it was yours, after it was sold... Was it not in your own control? Why as you conceived this thing in your heart, you have not lied to men, but to God? So we've got this story. Stay with me. This couple, see what Barnabas does, the impact it had, and then they gave him a new name, son of encouragement. So they decided, hey, let's sell some land we have. We've got this property, and we'll give the money to the church. Well, they thought maybe they'll give us a nickname. Barnabas, man, he, he, he's, look, look what everyone looks up to him. He, he, he's a leader. I think Peter had him over for dinner. We should do something. And I think perhaps his wife or either him said, but, you know, what about the boat we were going to get? The new chariot. So with full knowledge, they agreed, okay, we'll sell it. But we'll keep some of the money for ourselves, but we'll tell them that we're giving it all just like Barnabas did. So, I don't know where she went, but he goes to take the money. And he lays it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And he must have been shocked. How does he know? 
Did Sapphira come by here and spill the beans? What, what's happening? And, and it tells us, Ananias, hearing these things in verse 5, fell down and breathed his last. And so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I'm sure it did. And the young man arose, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. So he came. Here's the money. We sold it, the property. He makes the donation. And the Lord speaks to Peter and says, he's lying. This is how God felt about hypocrisy, phoniness, deceit. At the very beginning of the church, he said, I, I can't allow this. And there is, a, there is a biblical process of interpretation in Scripture called the principle of first things that runs through the Bible. And here's one of the first things that happens in the church, and it's hypocrisy, and it's dealt with. And you're wondering, okay, where is Sapphira? It tells you in verse 7, now three hours later, his wife came in, and she has no clue what's happened. Where has she been? The mall with the extra money? Maybe she's walking in and she's been to the spa. Got a new purse. <laughs> pair of new sandals. She comes in. And she's, you know, hey. Has Ananias been here? Oh, yeah, he's been here. Do you know where he is? Oh, yeah, we know where he is. <laughs> so, so they question her. Verse 8. Peter Answered her, T tell me, did you sell the land for so much? Oh, yeah, we sold it for so much. And Peter said, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. The young men came in, found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and those who heard these things. Isn't that amazing? At the very beginning of the church, God deals with hypocrisy. I mean, imagine if we took a poll. And I just want to see, try to establish, you know, some, some idea. You know, we're, we're, we're building a school over there. We're trying to think about our next step as it's growing. And, and we're, you know, got a lot of things going on that we're trying to upgrade and do here. We've just done a lot of work on air conditioning issues. There's roof issues. And, and let's say I said, how many would say here today? Now, don't, ra don't raise your hand. But if I said, hey, raise your hand. If you say, I, I give to the church 10%. I'm faithful, I'm consistent, I do what I believe is my best to honor the Lord. Raise your hand. And like every, tons of people raise your hand. And all of a sudden people start falling over. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> God gave Sapphira three hours to think about what was going on. I don't know if she bought a big Louis Vuitton, you know, purse or what she had. But she came cruising in there and wondered where her husband was. They said, yeah, we know where he is. Because God deals with hypocrisy and compromise. He even asks us to help each other be accountable. As the New Testament church grows... It, it, it leaves this kind of embryonic stage there in Jerusalem. And it spreads out into all kinds of cities and places around the world. And, and in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, you know, it, there, there's an amazing story there about, you know, accountability and, and what it means to, to be a real believer. And, and listen to what it says. They're having a similar problem that they had in the church of Thyatira. Speaking to the Corinthian church, Paul says, it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you. And, and it's such that it's not even named among the Gentiles. A man has his father's wife. So this is going on in the church. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. You're not embarrassed by this or taken back by it. You're proud of the fact that you're so tolerant. You would rather have mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. 
then he goes on and he says, I wrote to you in my epistle to not keep company with those who are involved in immorality. Yet I certainly do not mean with sexually immoral people of the world. He says, not unbelievers, he says, not that. Are, you'd have to, he goes on, so you'd have to leave the world to get away from them. But I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous. It doesn't just stop with sexually immoral. But covetous, idolater, reviler, drunkard, extortioner, not even to eat with these people. For, I, for what have I to do with judging those outside? I'm not, you know, they live that way. Do you not judge those, he says, who are inside? Of course. Judge, therefore, and he goes, you, you should put away that person. And you say, wow. Really? Yeah, he says that, that. See, the church, and I've used this illustration before, the church is a hospital for those who are sick. We all come in here and, you know, some are believers, some are not. It's a place where the truth can be taught, where people can respond to the Lord. And just like a hospital is a place where sick people go to get healthy. But a hospital... needs to be balanced. Like if you go into a hospital, you, you want it to be clean, right? You want it to be antiseptic. You want it to be a place where you can get healthy. And a church has to be like that. It, it has to be a place where, yeah, anyone can come through those doors, but like a hospital, it can't be so dirty where, oh, they never clean the IVs. They never, you know, uh, take time to... to uh, disinfect, they, they don't change the sheets. I mean, everyone would keep getting sicker and sicker. So, so in a church, not only is it a place where everyone's welcome to come, but it's also a place where you have to live in a way where you're not infecting others. Where you say, and that's what's happening in this Corinthian church here. You say, well, that seems pretty tough. Don't even associate with, well, did Jesus ever say anything like that? Well, listen to what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says something pretty interesting. He says, if your brother sins against you, or if he's, you know someone's involved in something, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he'll not hear you, well, take, take one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything may be established. You mean if someone's doing something I know is wrong, I'm supposed to go talk to them and try to help them and give them some instructions? Yeah, that, that's what we're supposed to do. And, and if he refuses to hear them, the couple you took with him, well, take it to the church. But if he refuses to even the church, this is Jesus talking, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In other words... They're probably not someone that you hang out with because you didn't hang out with tax collectors and Gentiles. Jesus says, if someone's doing something you know is wrong, lifestyle-wise, you go talk to them. It doesn't say, tell the small entire group what's going on. It doesn't say, go to the pastor. The instruction of Jesus, if you know a Christian, someone who God is connected to you, Go in private, and if they'll listen, it's awesome. But if they won't, well, take some people with you because it might be the fact that they say, oh, he said this, and he, no, take some witnesses. So now you take some others who love this person and can share with them. If they won't receive it, then you treat them like an unbeliever. Not take it to the church. Well, he goes on to say, finally take it to the church. This is interesting, and I'm almost finished. Listen to what it says. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. What does that mean, take it to the church? Say someone comes to you and says, hey, Jim Bob, what you're doing is wrong. Jim Bob kind of blows you off. So you go with a couple of friends and together you try to, you know, hey man, what, this is crazy what you're doing. You need to come back to the Lord. 
no, you guys are judging me, da 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 da. So you take it to the church, tell the pastors or whatever. So what are they going to do? Jim Bob sitting out there in the congregation the next Sunday. So you put his name up on the screen. <laughs> we got Jim Bob here today. <laughs> Jim Bob, could you stand up? And you call out his sins? No, 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 no. A, a leader they, they might respect and have received from and heard from and willing to listen to, loves them, loves the church, wants to protect and restore them. That, that's what it is. It's not like a public, okay. You say, John, have you ever been involved in that? Yeah. It's hard. It's difficult. And it can be extremely rewarding if the person responds. It can be very painful if they don't. But the first step is you or me individually going. It's not the pastor's job or, or your job to, eat, to also be a sin sniffer. You know, to be looking for those people. Pastor John, I found one. <laughs> Row seven, seat five. <laughs> no. Je Jesus, and we'll close this out in Revelation chapter two. He says, now to you, verse 24, Revelation chapter two. And to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces, as I also have received from my Father. And I'll give him the morning star. And then he closes out and closes out with this to most of the churches. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to those in the churches. Those involved in false worship, false lifestyles, seduced by culture, those who playing a game, who, who say, yeah, I, 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 God's my God, but worship everything but God. He said, I'll have to deal with them. But you hang in there till I come, he says. You persevere. Jesus says, there come a time I, I will reward you for your faithfulness. He says something interesting there. He says, I, I will give them the, the morning star. He said, what the heck is that? Well, in, in the natural world, the morning star is the planet Venus. It's the last star you see before the sun comes up. Some believe that when he speaks of the morning star here, that he is speaking of the rapture. That before the sun comes back, there'll be another light that will take us home. Some believe he's just talking about himself. And in fact, in Revelation, I'll just read this. Verse chapter 21, verse 6, it says, And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give the fountains of the water of life of those who freely thirst. And he goes on describing who he is. And then he says uh, something about himself being the morning Star. It's an interesting passage. Jesus describes himself as the morning star. And I think sometimes he says, I'll give you myself. That's going to be your reward. It's a reminder of his hope. It's a reminder of his favor. It's a reminder of his light. We have a warning and an encouragement to listen to the Son of God, the one with those fiery eyes and the feet of authority. Not to compromise, but to recognize that he gives us time to respond.
time to, to hold fast. And, and, and God gives you time. And it's amazing that, he, that he's given us the amount of time that he has in our lives to, to hear from him. Let me ask you a question and we'll, we'll close with this. He who has an ear to hear, he says at the end, let him hear. Is God speaking to you in some way or some fashion? Either about your relationship with him or things in your life like he was to the church of Thyatira. And he says, I want to give you some time to respond. You're here today and you feel like the Lord's been giving you some time. He's, he's been speaking. And he says, he who has an ear to hear, will you listen to me? Will you respond? And God has all kinds of ways of speaking. Sometimes through others, sometimes just by his Holy Spirit to your heart, sometimes many times, most of the time through his word. And knocks on that door and he calls. And he gives you an opportunity. That's what he means by time. An opportunity to, to, to hear my voice, to respond to the circumstances and situations that I bring about in your life. It's a reminder of his hope, his favor. Stand at the door and knock is what he says. If you hear me, if you hear my voice, I'll come in. And a lot of people, you know, God, God uses situations in their life as he gives them time. Maybe it's a sense of loneliness. You know, I, I have friends, I have family, but, but inside there's a loneliness I can't seem to feel. Or there's a fear of death. Or there's this understanding of something's missing. And he gives time. I remember when I was a young man, 18, 19 years old, and boy, you think you, think you have all the time in the world. And things started happening in my life, and people started getting saved. And, and I didn't really know, you know, what, what, what's going on? Isn't it interesting how almost overnight sometimes life can change? It's not the same anymore. And God gives time for you to respond. And he's gracious. But he's still Jesus resurrected with those fiery eyes and he looks into your life and he looks into my life and he gives time and he says at the end of this passage of scripture if you'll just listen to me if you have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying I'll give you time to respond so I you know there's no one here today that would be able to stand up and say, John, there's nothing in my life I need to change. Well, you do. You're a liar. You need to change that. <laughs> we, we all have issues. And aren't you grateful that the Lord speaks to you with those fiery eyes that you might change, that you might say, okay, Lord, you found me out. He said, I didn't come to find you out, he says. I came to help you out. Because I created you and I love you. And I know what's best for you. Just like a small child. You, you don't go there to, to find them out and to be mean to them. But you, you go in there to, to help them. So that they might be able to live a life. Without all the consequences of that which is wrong. And that's his heart. God the Father sent his only son that you and I might be not only saved from our sin, but also from the consequence of our sin. And I remember when he started looking into my heart, into my life with those fiery eyes and the authority of being the son of God who died for me. And I resisted and I made excuses and Lord, you know, this is okay and that's okay. And he gave me a lot of time. And then finally one day, he kept knocking and knocking and knocking. And I said, Lord, I don't know where else to go. 
like Peter one time when he said, you alone have the words of eternal life. I tried all kinds of things. But he was the truth. He was the way. And he's been the life for many, many years. And if you don't know him, he knows you. And he's knocking, he's calling, and he wants you to come home.